I once had an exchange with another Wilson, my friend James Q. Wilson, who's been led into his ventures into moral judgment to favor a theory of moral sentiments. For example, that there are natural ties of sentiment and affection binding parents to their own children. Something that may be true most of the time, but not necessarily true as we've seen by the enduring massive fact that some parents are evidently willing, up, willing to order up the killing of their own children in infanticide and abortion. And I think of the old Woody Allen line, this is a watch that my father on his deathbed sold me. <laughs> but Wilson thought that women contemplating an abortion should be compelled to look at the sonogram of a child in the womb of about eight to 10 weeks. His hunch was that most people will look at that screen, see what they plainly recognize as a child, and back away from the abortion. But his theory summons us to recall Kant's warning that even a unanimity of feeling cannot offer a surrogate for a moral judgment. Even if we were unanimous in our passion for the Coca-Cola, that would not give us the ground for making the Coca-Cola compulsory. Feeling and taste may be contingent and changing. If our laws on abortion turn decisively on the question of how that child in the womb looked to me and if 95% of the people looked at that sonogram and said, that looks like a baby to me, that could still not supply the ground for a law that barred the abortion for the 5% who looked at the sonogram and said, well, it doesn't look like a baby to me. It isn't what it looks like, but what it is. And whether there is any ground of principle for regarding that offspring in the womb as anything less than a human being. <clears throat> and yet, as James Wilson, our founder, noted, even people taking jurisprudence as their vocation have been lured in the past by theories of epistemology, holding to the notion that can be composed at best, that, we, that, our, that our understanding can be composed at best only of things we perceive. Wilson cited one of the leading authorities on the law of evidence in Britain, Baron Gilbert, who held to the doctrines of John Locke that knowledge is nothing but the perception of the agreement or disagreement of our ideas. And so Wilson archly remarked, we have hitherto been apt perhaps with unphilosophic credulity to imagine that thought supposed a thinker, that treason implied a traitor, but correct philosophy, it appears, is that discovers that this is all a mistake. There may be treason without a traitor, laws without a legislator, punishment without a sufferer. If in these cases the ideas are the traitor, the legislator, the sufferer, the author of this discovery ought to inform us whether ideas can converse together, whether they can possess rights or be under obligations, whether they can make promises or enter into covenants. As Wilson would teach, going in and going out, teach in these lectures, teach in the first cases coming before the Supreme Court, a regime of law requires us to reject decisively those theories of moral skepticism and relativism that have ever been seductive to people who have dabbled in philosophy and affected to have a liberal education. We begin by recognizing a real world, including a moral world with rights and wrongs as real as rocks and trees. And so it reveals no dimness of mind to begin with the things that come visibly in sight or come to us through our senses. As Wilson pointed out, in the presence of a doubting Thomas, Jesus bade him touch the wounds, feel directly himself, and from that evidence know that Jesus had indeed been put upon the cross. In drawing on the evidence of the senses, we touch the level of the most natural knowledge we seem to have, and yet we may neglect the depth of that knowledge. For we may touch here on what Thomas Reed called a nat the natural language, the things we had to know in order to do translations from one language to another. To a person who knows no English, I point to an object and say, book, telephone, 
He needs no manual to instruct him that we are now doing translations. His natural understanding moves him to engage in translation if he, even if he doesn't know the word. Drawing on that natural knowledge, we can tell the difference instantly between a smiling, warm, welcoming face and a hostile expression. We know the difference between the crowd welcoming the White Sox back home after they won the World Series and the menacing crowd standing outside the home of the black, first black family moving into the neighborhood. It became plausible to ask then a, a couple of years ago, when the actor Robert Blake heard that his wife had been murdered, had his face reflected shock, despair, or indifference? And is that difference not telling? Does it not reveal something that may bear on innocence and guilt? The point is, that we are, as we are constituted, to understand things of this kind. And if we could not understand them, it is hard to imagine how we could form estimates of motives and judgments of guilt and innocence. When we consider testimony, the notable thing that may go unnoticed here is the disposition of people in the first place to come forward and tell what they know and to speak truthfully. What may be engaged is a natural sense of justice, a desire to see the rights and wrongs truly sorted out so that the innocent are not wrongly punished. And we tend to think that when people do come forward in this way, they generally come forward to tell us the truth. As Wilson remarked, even the most consummate liar declares truths much more frequently than falsehoods. My youngest son and I, in a trip through Italy, stopped often to ask directions when driving through towns in Tuscany. We were among strangers. We didn't know what the local conventions were for treating strangers or how the local, locals found their mirth. For all we know, it might have been a local sport to misdirect tourists who needed directions. And yet we assumed, quite rightly as it turned out, that the people offering the directions were telling the truth. They may misdirect us, but they almost never betray a malicious willingness to mislead. It is also one of the most enduring and overlooked parts of our nature that we seek the guidance of people who know more than we do, and we have reason to defer to their authority. If we are not ourselves physicians, we seek out doctors who are respected for their skill and integrity. One of the strangest misunderstandings of democracy in this respect, and the most curious misreading of human nature, is that when people become part of a ruling legislature or take a place in the circles of power, their natural inclination is to act out their own reflexes or their animating passions. But John Stuart Mill caught something true in his considerations on representative government when he remarked that anyone would feel a fool at being excluded but only a fool, and a fool of peculiar description, would think of pressing his uninformed opinion on people who evidently know far more than he. And so as Tocqueville noted, people cannot long be members of this, these groups until they realize that they should hold back to learn how order is arranged in these groups, how issues are framed and justified. And people learn to merge their interests with those of others in this way, as Tocqueville said, politics becomes not merely an arena of politics, but a great school, a school for instructing people in how to reconcile their interests with those of others, and to hold back at times from pressing their interests when they cannot persuade and elicit the consent of others. But again, this is part of the repertoire of that creature who alone has the competence to deliberate about the making of laws because he alone has the capacity to frame propositions that can claim to be binding. As Aristotle taught us again, what is distinctive to human beings is that capacity to give and understand reasons over matters of right and wrong. That is what Aristotle meant by the faculty of language, not merely making sounds to indicate pleasure or pain, but giving reasons for measures that they would impose on others as law. And of course, language is the mark of a distinctly social animal. It can't be cultivated in solitude. James Wilson, in his lectures on law, draws out the implications that spring from the nature of humans as social animals, implications so evident that they go unseen. Wilson took as a leading example the notion of contracts, making promises. 
And Daniel Webster, in a marvelous brief in the, the old Dartmouth College case, Dar Nathaniel Webster pointed out the form of, that the form of contracts may depend on the laws of the place in which they're made, the positive law. But the logic of a contract, he said, is of universal law. Even people stranded on desert islands make promises to each other. They stake their lives on the prospect that that promise will be kept. And the obligations generated in that way have often been upheld by courts when the survivors are returned to the mainland. One of the dimensions of that distinctly social character, rarely noticed, was caught in an odd way by the historian Macaulay in a critical review of Boswell's Life of Johnson. Remarking on different parts of the character of Samuel Johnson, Macaulay noted, Johnson was not much moved even by the spectacle of Lady Tavistock dying of a broken heart for the loss of her lord. Such grief he considered as a luxury reserved for the idle and the wealthy. A washerwoman, he said, left a widow with nine small children, would not have sobbed herself to death. Beyond the want of sympathy here, for a woman who missed her, the husband she loved, there was a profound high view of the human condition. And it touched what President Reagan used to call the heroism of ordinary life. A widow left largely on her own summons the strength to do what it is in her power to do to hold things together. She accepts deep privations in her standard of living and in her liberty in order to care for those children. I've heard stories lately of teenagers raised in households of the affluent and the educated, but cultivating the most refined anguish and actually cutting themselves in despair. That despair may really grip them, but it may also be a luxury that cannot be afforded by people in straightened, truly desperate circumstances with vulnerable lives depending on them. That widow with nine children could not afford to give in to that despair. Once again, this is a story to be told only among creatures who have a sense of obligation that overpowers their inclination to seek their own comfort or safety. It's the only thing that can explain that letter, that letter written home by um, a soldier on the Union side during the Civil War, collected in Jim McPherson's book. He was responding to the wife who told him he was needed back home. And he said, what good is the home if we lose the country? Our fathers, he said, risked and gave their lives to secure us this freedom, our right to govern ourselves. And there are people now truly wanting to take that away. In my own case, my own case, it is a hard fact that my family and I are alive today only because of people who risk their lives and gave their lives in the Second World War. Through grand luck, we found ourselves safely removed to America. We live in a regime of constitutional freedom thanks to these monumental acts of conviction and sacrifice and to the comparable gifts made by those Union soldiers in the Civil War. I'm not embarrassed to say that the reading of those letters written by those men is something that still brings me close to tears. For it reveals again those people who are willing to risk their lives in order to preserve this regime of freedom as a gift even for people not of their families, people of another generation they could not possibly know. If we say that a regime of law begins with the nature of that creature who alone can understand an obligation, it must take that measure to a sublime level when we find people willing to give up their lives out of respect for the goodness in principle of that kind of regime and their obligation to preserve it enduringly for those who would come later as the enduring good it is understood to be. It doesn't make sense to think of this as an ephemeral good, good only in certain epics, and not something we can know to be enduringly good. All this comes down then to that matter of the human person. As Lincoln said, 
The question is whether the Negro is or is not a man. If he's not a man, why in that case, he who is a man may, as a matter of self-government, do with him just as he pleases. But if he is a man, then my ancient faith tells me all men are created equal. Or as Harry Jaffa put it, the question of whether the black man is a human is not a value judgment. It does not depend on whether any one of us or most of us happen to value his life or are willing to regard him as human. It depends on the objective truth of the matter whether black people are indeed human. And yet we saw in the past that facile move that has endured even in our own day and even among people with, may I say, pricey educations, a willingness to remove a whole class of people from the domain of rights-bearing beings through the simple device of switching the labels and describing them in a different way. That is not a human being, just like the ones we know. That's a nigger. That's not a human being. That's a fetus or an embryo. It may always be convenient to slip people easily out of the domain of rights-bearing beings when it accords with our self-interest. But we might see the problem in another light when we approach it from this angle. This regime of law and natural liberty begins, as I say, with the premise that those beings we call moral agents, those beings who can deliberate about matters of right and wrong and the grounds of their own be being, these moral agents have a presumptive claim to all dimensions of their freedom as they act on their moral sense. The burden falls to the government when it would restrict that freedom, take their property in taxation, or take their lives. But then how could it be that the government is required to come forth with the most compelling justifications when it would restrict the liberty, take the property of people, and yet not be compelled to come forward with justifications even more demanding when it makes the move even more audacious to remove those human beings in a stroke from the very class of those rights-bearing beings who have a claim to those natural rights to life, liberty, and property. As I move to my end here, in my book, Natural Rights and the Right to Choose, I recall that scene after the shootings of abortion clinics in Brookline, Massachusetts. There was a candlelight vigil, and one woman bearing a candle carried also her newborn daughter. And she, has, she said she was there to preserve for her daughter the same reproductive rights that she has enjoyed, including the right to destroy that daughter right up through the time of birth. That declaration had to bring the question, were those reproductive rights a species of natural rights? Well, as James Wilson said, natural rights begin as soon as we begin to be which is why he said the common law casts its protection over human life from the first stirrings in the womb. If those reproductive rights of the child were a species of natural rights, well, she actually had those rights as soon as she began to be. She had them while she was still in the womb. But in that case, her mother could not have been warranted in simply sweeping away her reproductive rights through the simple expedient of, of sweeping away in a stroke the bearer of the rights. Obviously, that was not the account of the rights that this new mother had in mind. The only account left was that the mother, in a grand Nietzschean gesture, said, I now confer upon you the right to live because there's nothing about you incompatible with my interests. Now, if that is the account of how we acquire our rights in the beginning, it should be clear that rights will have been stripped of their moral logic. They don't begin with any recognition of the child herself as bearing an intrinsic dignity, which the rest of us are obliged to respect, and bearing then in turn rights of an intrinsic dignity that we're obliged to respect, and stripped of that logic, the right to abortion becomes nothing more than a right conferred by those with the power to confer it, and that right may be withdrawn in turn when it no longer serves the utility 
or the interests of those with the power to confer it. In his classic studies of Lincoln, Harry Jaffa drew from Lincoln's teaching this fundamental lesson, that a free people should be obliged to respect, in the first instance, the premises on which their own freedom rests. People claim a right to vote only on that premise of all men are created equal, that the only rightful government over human beings depends on the consent of the governed. It is a massive act of incoherence for a people licensed to vote, to use their votes to enslave other men, for as Lincoln showed, there is no ground to justify the enslavement of black people that would not apply to many whites as well. And some of us have sought with the same reasoning to show that there is nothing one could cite to withdraw the protections of the law from children in the womb that would not apply quite as well to many people walking about while outside the womb. We find many people in the country illegally who wish to become citizens. In fact, they claim a right to become citizens. But since they are not citizens now, those rights they claim cannot flow to them through any rights they possess as citizens. They must be invoking a body of rights not dependent on the laws of any particular place. They must be invoking, dare we say it, some notion of natural rights, some rights attaching to human beings as human beings. But in that case, can we not put at least this question to them about the moral terms on which we live together in a constitutional order? Are they prepared at least to support a regime of citizens? That is, when they go into a voting booth and pull the lever, do they understand they're not really making a choice among candidates and policies, but they are affirming with that move the rightness of a regime of law and the equal rights of those people around them to have a regime of voting. Well, such has not always been the case. In Germany in 1932, people went to the polls willing to strip those around them, not only of their voting rights, but of their civil rights and their natural rights. When people join us now as citizens, do they understand that they have an obligation not to vote for the kinds of political parties that will strip their fellow citizens of the right to be protected by the law in their lives, and yes, the right not to have their property confiscated? Do they understand that they are no more permitted to vote away these rights for others than they are permitted to vote away the rights of their children and themselves in a regime of voting? Do they understand, that is, the notion of a right so deep, so grounded in nature, that they may not be alienated or waived even for oneself? James Wilson and many of the founders understood that the first principles of our political life are grasped as the first principles of our understanding, often instantly accessible to ordinary people without a college education. Ordinary people readily understand that it is wrong to hold people blameworthy for acts they were powerless to effect, or for the wrongs only that they do, not the wrongs done by their family or by that racial group of which they happen to be a part. But the founders also understand that not all of the moral and logical presuppositions of a constitutional order were quickly and widely understood. As Aquinas reminded us, self-evident truths were not always evident to every self happening down the street. As, much, as with much else in human life, those understandings required the kind of cultivation and education that is possible only for human beings. The test of a good political regime was it, whether it managed to impart that understanding to the people who would preserve a regime of freedom and constitutional restraint. But in that project, a government and a people could misinstruct one another through the policies they are content to put in place and sustain over the years, as we have been amply misinstructed already. The test for us right now is whether we can bring forth a political class that could teach 
anew what was taught so ably by that first generation of the American founders, and whether we as a people have our souls in a condition right now in which we've been prepared to receive that teaching anew and to recognize it when we hear it again. Thanks very much. Thank you.